I don't think anybody can hear us because Mary's online. She's not able to hear us as well. We can hear you now, Eric. Oh, right. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And get started and call the stewardship subcommittee meeting to order. And I will just kind of help manage through the agenda, uh, which first on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the previous meetings. Um, Stephen, since you're new to council, the expectation is that you can abstain from this, but for councilors Broadman and Perkins. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed with the one abstention. All right, um, we do have public comment today. So um, Mayor Pro Tem Broadman, I'm just gonna ask that you uh, help us work through the public comment. It's actually in person. Thanks, we have one person who signed up for public comment. We're gonna hold these to two minutes. Um, so Kayla, will you be keeping track of that? Yes, sir. Great, thanks. So Bill Colton. Am I supposed to come up here? Either the table or the podium. Either one's fine. I'd like to address this uh, this Ben uh, Stewart thing. I need to address the energy audits that you guys are coming out. Affordable housing and Ben, you know, the cost of the audits are going to be passed on to the buyers. What happened to that, you guys? Everybody's worried about affordable housing. Um, also, going forward, I have a concern about the improvements that are going to be outlined in the audits and pass on to the sale of the home. So that's gonna also increase the price of the home. Video showed in your uh, energy audits, they had infrared cameras. Concern that I have is if they reveal a, a section of insulation that's not up against the uh, sheetrock, you know, would this be, uh, have a goal where you have to come in and have a small area of, of insulation installed by tearing out the sheetrock, putting in the insulation, and then trying to match that wall. It's very costly, very expensive. Uh, I, I've just got a feeling that the end game of the Bend Council, you know, you guys have said this in your thing that you've got a 40% uh, reduction of fuel fossils by the year 2030. And the concerns that I have is that I think it's very aggressive and that you guys are going to, you know, some, I believe, going to get rid of gas furnaces, water heaters, gas fireplaces, and uh, uh, stoves. And, and that's a real big concern for me. That's it within eight years. I also believe the committee is just testing the water right now. You guys are coming in here. That not very many people know about this energy audit coming out. I don't know how you're going to reach them, but they really don't know what, what the uh, consequences are going to be. And there's gonna be added you know, cost uh, along with these energy audits. And the concern that I have is that you're gonna, you know, it's gonna be very expensive in the future. And I don't know where your agenda starts and stops and if you're gonna require everything in the uh, audits to be performed at a later date down the road. Okay. Well, just give me a couple seconds here. But, sir, I think we're, there's I, one, we haven't really, broach this issue at the council level. You have lots of other opportunities to comment on it. We don't, we haven't even had the uh, presentation here yet today. So we're going to hold you to two minutes, encourage you to please come back to the full council. We are simply the, the subcommittee for stewardship. Okay. And I encourage you to listen to the presentation that we're about to hear. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, that's, that's fine. I All right, so that's a good segue into our next agenda item, which is an update on the home energy score, uh, providing an overview and discussion are Cassie Lacey, uh, Serena Dietrich, and Peter Rube with the Environment and Climate Committee. Kayla, what's the best way for me to um, get this up there? Oh, I have to join the Zoom. the Zoom. I did not do that. I'll do that really quick. Unless there's like, there's not like a plugin or anything I can do now. Okay, sorry about that. I'm plugged in already. If you want me to share my screen, if you just tell me where the look file is, Cassie. <laughs> Can I email it to you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, 
I can start with the intro. I just sent it to you, see if you could pull it up. Um, so hello, uh, uh, good afternoon or good morning, counselors. Um, so we're, my name is Cassie Lacey. I'm a senior management analyst in the city manager's office. I'm the liaison to the Environment and Climate Committee. I'm here with a couple members of our Environment and Climate Committee. I'll let them introduce themselves. Hello, Serena Dietrich, vice chair. Peter Groove, member. Um, and so we're, we're here today because, um, as you'll remember, we discussed with the stewardship subcommittee in March that the ECC has been working with developing a home energy score program, which is part of our community climate action plan and one of the top priorities for the committee for implementation this biennium. So we're at a point where we have a proposed program and we're currently soliciting public feedback on the draft program. And so we wanted to do kind of a mid process check in with the stewardship subcommittee and share more details about the proposed program and how it will work, give you an update on the timeline, and then just get feedback and questions from you all so that we can make sure to address any questions that you have before ultimately bringing the program back to you to consider um, in fall. Do you receive the? Just got it. Okay. Um, well, to get started, um, as a reminder, a home energy score is a standard home energy assessment tool that explains the energy efficiency of a home through a replicable and affordable methodology that assesses a home's phys physical attributes. And the scorecard, um, so I'm just on the second slide. The scorecard contains a numeric score that reflects the energy efficiency of the home. It includes its estimated utility costs and also suggested measures that the homeowner can take to improve efficiency. So the goals of the home energy and the tool itself um, was developed by the U.S. Department of Energy, and it was created for cities to create policies like this and, and have the standard tool that can be used. So the goals of a home energy score program is that it's really meant to be kind of analogous to a, a miles per gallon rating of a vehicle where it's kind of a simple measure that people can see to understand how efficiently a home uh, runs compared to other homes when they're making decisions about which home to purchase. The home energy score, the goal is that it can provide transparency to home buyers about the energy costs of potential homes at the point when they're deciding which home to buy. Um, and ultimately the goal is that it would motivate voluntar voluntary energy efficiency investment by making the information just kind of readily available, easy to understand, which empowers home buyers to actually go ahead and make energy efficiency upgrades. And the benefit of that, of course, is that it would reduce community greenhouse gas emissions, which is the goal of our community climate action plan. So um, on this slide, it just shows a sample of what the scorecard looks like. This is a home, a home energy score. This is an example from Hillsborough. So on the right is the front of the scorecard. It's got the numeric score and um, the estimated utility costs. And then on the left is the backside of the scorecard, which shows the suggested energy efficiency improvements. So the idea is that this is what would be included um, for homes with a home energy score program. So next slide. So for the home energy score program, um, the requirement would be that all covered buildings that are being listed publicly for sale in Bend are required to obtain a home energy score from a state licensed home energy assessor. The score must be included in the listing and made available to all prospective buyers who visit the building. They would be required to get it at the time of listing rather than the time of sale, which ensures that this whole process doesn't actually impact the transaction process of, of, getting, of buying a home because it happens before the home is listed for sale. And um, covered building includes, um, that's defined in the code, and it includes any residential structure containing a single dwelling unit on its own lot, so all single family homes. And then it also includes attached dwelling units, regardless of whether they're on their own lot, where each unit extends from foundation to roof. So townhouses, duplexes, other kinds of attached houses are still um, covered by this. There are um, certain properties are exempt from the program. So generally speaking, the categories of homes that are exempt would be involuntary change of titles and then um, sales where significant financial hardship has been indicated. So like a trustee sale or a deed in lieu to floor closure sales um, are proposed to be exempt from the program. And that's in line with other cities that have these programs. Um, and then the committee is uh, recommending that the city also establish a low-income assistance program where the city would provide grants to the um, owner of the home 
uh, that covers the cost of obtaining the score if the seller has been deemed eligible to participate in a low income assistance offered by the city. So that ensures that um, for where the cost of the score is, is a significant burden for someone that we are willing to cover that. And then for um, new construction, there's kind of an, an easier path to get a score where uh, builders can get the score before the home is finished construction, since typically the home is sold before the construction is complete and all of the things are in place. So for new construction, there's a pre-construction assessment where the home energy assessor can review the construction documents to get the information needed. And then in the case where there is like a new subdivision going in and there's identical homes that are being replicated throughout, they also have kind of a streamlined pathway to get the home energy score using that pre-construction assessment because in essence, they can, if there's three different floor plans, they can just replicate that same score for all the different addresses that have that same identical floor plan. So new construction is still covered by the program, but there is kind of an easier pathway for them to, to get them done kind of quickly and easily. Cassie, what if I was, you know, what not selling, what, not one of selling my house, not new construction, but interested in just to find out my own energy score for my own home. Um, what would be the process there? So the, the process to get a score is that um, it all happens in the private market. So if you were going to list your home, you would just contact one of the home energy assessors and get the assessment done. If you're not going to sell your home, you can contact them the same and mm -hmm. get it. So that is kind of another benefit of the program is yeah. that it's kind of a, a lower cost streamline energy audit option that people have outside of just the home sale process. And there are other options for that already in Bend, but the home energy score is kind of this like, it's a tool developed to be like an easier, lower cost energy audit than some of the other options that exist today, which are a little bit more costly and intensive. That's a great question. Um, okay, the next, okay. Um, so there are several platforms across the nation that can host the home energy scores. The Pacific Northwest is um, served by something called the Green Building Registry. It's owned and operated by Earth Advantage, who is a nonprofit that's a partner with the state in kind of implementing the home energy score program. So once a home energy score is completed, the score gets uploaded in to the Green Building Registry um, automatically. And that's a public registry. So anyone can go on and search for a property and they can pull up the home energy score. And there's other types of um, green building information that's published on that green building registry. Like if you're Earth Advantage certified, that's often included on there. So that software already exists out there. And then the green building registry can be used with the MLS system. They can be integrated if the, if the MLS system allows it to, so that it can just pull directly from the green building registry to the MLS listing, which makes it really easy for being in compliance with the program and having the score listed. It, it, if it's set up right, you can just kind of automatically populate that. Um, next slide. So for um, the home energy assessment will be a new and widely needed service in the community. So it's something that in order to perform the home energy assessment, assessors have to be authorized by the state um, to create them. And so there is a multi-step process to become authorized to do that. It involves a training uh, through the US DOE on the tool, some additional training and licensing by the state of Oregon, um, and also some mentoring by Earth Advantage. Earth Advantage estimates that we would need 10 assessors to serve the demand in Bend, and that's kind of covering the, the peak time. How many do we have right now? So we don't, we only have one right now because typically what happens is that once a program comes into place, like it's not really in demand right now since right. we don't have a program. So one of the things that we would recommend is once, if, once, if the program was adopted, we'd have like a waiting period to allow um, people in the community to get trained on it. And it only takes about a month to get um, authorized, it's $625. And we have been contacted by a couple of home inspectors already who are um, planning on getting certified. I would also add to answer that question, if you wanted one now for your personal house or someone, there's already uh, suppliers at a statewide level who provide the services here in Central Oregon specifically. Um, Earth Advantage has a certifier who is do this score, and then it's called Home RX, which is a branch of performance insulation, and their trucks are already traveling around here in Central Oregon providing those services. So more will come online. That's been the experience from other projects, but it's all 
already readily available. Thanks, Peter. Um, and a, a, an additional thing about the home energy assessors is that the USDOE requires that um, quality assurance is conducted for the home energy score uh, tool. And so Earth Advantage has been hired by the state of Oregon Department of Energy to provide quality assurance across the state for cities that have policies. So Earth Advantage would be doing that quality assurance for us as well. They have a process where they go in and they make sure that assessors um, kind of continuing education to make sure they're doing the assessments um, accurately and consistently. And then um, the cost of the assessment is set by the market. And so, um, and typically in other markets, it's ranged from anywhere from 150 to $300. The transaction, like I said, just happens from the, the homeowner directly to the assessor. So the city has, does not get involved in that at all. It's something, uh, the cost of it is something that we as staff will definitely be tracking a couple of times a year to make sure it doesn't get to a point where it's becoming a very high burden. And as we've shared, um, there would be the low income assistance program for people who the 150 to $300 is a significant burden for their home sale. But what would we do if say, what, like say there's only three and they're polluting and they start charging people $1,200, what would we do? Yeah, I mean, it hasn't that we would, we would definitely want to pause and talk about that. It's not, um, it hasn't happened in other communities yet, but it's something that all the cities are kind of talking about. Like what is the threshold where a city intervenes with that? Because it has raised a little bit, like to be fully transparent, they started at 150, they're up to like 225 in the Hillsborough area. Mm -hmm. And they've kind of seen it plateau around there. Um, so that's something that no one has dealt with yet, but that's why we want to be um, watching it. And so I we, think, oh, sorry. yeah, I mean, I would, if it really got to be, out of mind, we could reevaluate the program at any time. We would like quickly change the code, or what would we do? Suspend it? Um, it might be a question for Mary about how to like pause a code. Yeah, I mean, a council, I mean, it's a, it would probably be through a resolution or something that you could suspend a uh, something in your code. Mary, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, if it's a real concern, it'd probably be something we'd want to put in one of the sections of the code upon adoption to give us authority to suspend the code um, if the price got too high, or it could even be something there is in the code already, the ability to adopt administrative rules. So that also could be something that we have in the administrative rules that, um, you, that we say, that we're gonna monitor the price and that would be another mechanism for reviewing um, both the number of the assessors out there and the price that you could So like just kind of thinking out loud, if we wanted to do it, probably the most streamlined way would be to say in a finding upon adoption that you're directing the city manager to, to monitor both the number and the price and to adopt administrative rules that give direction on what staff's supposed to do on those topics. Um, Councilor Broadman, it's a good, it's a good question because it would be a big concern. What we found in studying um, real life scenarios from Austin to Portland. So in fact, uh, market forces have driven the price down. So the concern isn't so much that it's going up, but um, a, a large number of certifiers come online, um, taking their trade, their skills in other trades and saying, hey, this is another opportunity to add to my resources of what I do. And the competitive market is actually weeded out. Um, if people don't have a good enough operation or the market weeds out the, the poor performers and uh, the people who can offer the best service, quickest response time at the lowest cost are surviving. So the number offering it um, has actually weeded out as groups have gone out of business and the price has remained actually gone down from when they first offer. Um, so it's a great, we wouldn't want to see that happen, but uh, real life scenario is not supporting it. That's the way it goes. Okay. And same thing for the number of assessors, what the city of Portland did was before the program launched, they wrote into their ordinance language that like, if there are not X number of assessors by the time the program start date is, 
like we will pause implementation and postpone it. So that's something we had been talking about um, including as well. And so we can go with the 10 that Earth Advantage recommends. We could go a little bit more conservative if we want to say 12 or something like that. So um, yeah, there's definitely options and we'll be sure to, to cover those in the final version. Um, okay, and then, um, so that's kind of the overview of how the program works. And then the last bit is just um, on the staffing resources and enforcement, which we talked about a little bit in March. We're anticipating for this program, we would need um, a quarter to a half FTE at most to oversee the program. And what that FTE is doing is kind of this proactive level of enforcement where they review listings, they find homes that are out of compliance, and then they do a lot of really proactive education and outreach to those homeowners saying like, this is a program that exists. Did you know about it? Here's all the information you need to get a score, explaining the why behind it and kind of just building that understanding among homeowners and other, that's the way that the other cities in Oregon have done it. And they have seen with that proactive enforcement model, they have very, very good compliance, like over 90%. And so um, the, the program proposed is that there would be a 15 day grace period to come to compliance. So that would be the 15 days that that staff person is doing kind of that, um, that education. And then if they were to not come into compliance within 15 days, it would get referred to code enforcement and then go through our standard code, um, code enforcement process. Um, there can be a flexible amount of enforcement. So what some other cities have done is like, if they just don't have like a full half FTE to, to really do a lot of it, they'll, they'll just um, do enforcement on like a portion of listings. So instead of doing every listing every day, they'll do 10% of listings per day. So different cities have chosen different pathways for that. So um, we would need additional resources for it, but it is kind of flexible in, in how we do it, um, depending on the level of, of priority. There, there will be an additional workload for, like any new code, there's an additional workload for code enforcement for the homes that do get referred to them. We're not um, requesting any additional resources there, but just kind of a note that it does, um, it can impact our code enforcement staff as well. Um, we're not anticipating with the proactive level of enforcement, we don't anticipate that there would, it should be a huge additional load. If we didn't have that kind of, that additional staff person, it probably would end up falling on code enforcement much more heavily. Um, and then I don't, I didn't put it on the slide, but the additional resource needed in addition to the staff would be cover it that the low income assistance uh, program, we would need to have a small pool of funds to be able to make sure we could cover the grants to cover those. And then as far as the process um, for the program and where we're at, on January 11th, we kind of launched a public information and engagement opportunity where we have a public facing website with all this information. Um, the memos that we sent to you before this meeting are listed on there. And we actually have um, like an online input form for people to just go ahead and provide feedback on the program directly. Um, to staff and that we can then incorporate into later iterations. We've received hundreds of comments through that already. Um, and then today is the council stewardship subcommittee discussion. So again, it's just this is kind of our mid process council check in to just see what questions and concerns you have engage where you are at with it. And then our next important key date is that a week from today, we're going to have an open house that's meant to be kind of a Q&A session where we'll have a panel of staff members and committee members to just, um, we'll do a presentation on the, on the program similar to what I just provided. And then we'll allow an opportunity for kind of a back and forth Q and A. So people can really understand the program. We can clarify any uh, misunderstanding about how it works, how it doesn't work, and just kind of try to build a little bit better of a shared um, understanding in the community of how the program would work. So that's gonna be, that's scheduled to be next Monday. And then from there, um, sometime this fall, we expect that the committee would be ready to kind of formally recommend the program to the council. We're anticipating that'll happen around the October, their October meeting. And then following that, we would request a work session with council to, to speak with the full council about it. And then, um, you know, the process would move forward from there um, to, to make the, to, to ultimately adopt the program would be an, an ordinance. So it would be, you know, the first and second reading. So I think the goal would was would be to get it done um, that completed by the end of the year if everyone wanted to move forward. But of course, 
um, you know, it will unfold however it will. So um, that's the overview from me. And before we go to questions and feedback, Serena or Peter, do you have any just um, comments to add from the committee? Oh. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thanks for a couple minutes here. Um, I know this is the stewardship committee, so I think the tasked with uh, responsible use of the city's resources. Um, so when I'm looking at the home energy score program, um, I come from a background about 15 years locally in the building and real estate development industry. So I look at this from the private sector point of view and with my experience. Um, I appreciate also the gentleman with the public comment. Um, those are some of the concerns we've heard. And I know he didn't get the time he wanted. There's more that he mentioned about this. And we have actually been, personally, I've been engaged heavily with that. Conversations with the real estate industry, with brokers, um, with the general public, with actually friends and colleagues in the industry who have concerns about this program. Um, so I wanted to share with the stewardship committee that I've been deeply involved um, with vetting uh, home energy score with vetting other third party verified um, energy performance programs. And I've been incredibly impressed through this process of um, my own experience locally and then research on this particular program with how well crafted and thought out this program is. Um, we're not inventing something new. It's come down from the resources of the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy forming this. It's a template that's used by communities across the country. So if someone moves from one market to another, they're used to seeing this information provided. Um, you know, we look for uh, co-benefits when we're thinking as far as the Environment and Climate Committee, what kind of policies are out there and what kind of co-benefits can we get? So we do one thing, get multiple benefits. So we're Environment and Climate Committee, we're trying to address one thing is the carbon issue through use of energy in homes and a really tough nut to crack has been, how do we address the existing housing stock? It's, it's not too hard in, in my experience to address new homes that are coming online. That's pretty straightforward. But the existing housing stock is really challenging because people are living in the homes and People don't have a lot of knowledge, even if they are interested and do care, they don't have a lot of information and then they don't know where to start if they do wanna make a difference. So the ease of the information being laid out in the home energy score with the number that's recognizable, um, also providing like, hey, what's my carbon footprint here? What's my cost? So you're associating a value with these changes and they don't know where to start. So changes are listed at the bottom. Um, you know, I think the education process that uh, Cassie's describing here is going to be critical because there's a ton of misunderstanding or misinformation out there. And if you were to think that's how the program ran, it would be very concerning. Like I've heard even recently that people are going to have to make the changes listed on the uh, home energy score. And that's not at all the case or the intent. The intent is to add um, a starting place and a return on investment component. So people say, hey, here's a low hanging fruit. This is how I can prove my score if I choose to quickly and easily, because otherwise people are kind of don't have a starting spot. So being in the industry, I've seen that the recommended proposals are excellent. Like these are low hanging fruit with very quick return on investment that people can do while they're living in a home easily. Um, we're also seeing that you know energy costs are spiking. People want to know what they can do. Um, so that's a benefit for the homeowner as well as the city's objectives. Um, creating, you know, in business, we have the saying, you can't fix what you can't measure. So we're not measuring what our housing stock is doing in any meaningful way. So as we build a comprehensive score across the city by location by age of house by type of house um, that data is invaluable to not just the city but utilities want this information so i see these co-benefits of this program that's very well vetted um, i'm completely comfortable that using we have the advantage in ben that we are not the first to go to market with this this is existing across the country with all kinds of municipalities so i'm a data guy an information guy and the concerns that have been raised, we've heard some of these concerns for years when it first came up as part of the um, community climate action plan. So I looked into them because I certainly don't want to have unintended consequences. I want 
the goals to be reached in a successful uh, manner for homeowners, for industry, uh, for the city. And ultimately we're doing this for the climate. Like if we think there's a problem, we have to do something and the time is now. So from my point of view, my experience in this field, if we have a quarter time or half time uh, position, the, there's already a third party that can help administer this. Earth Advantage is extremely well qualified and experienced in this field. They help with the vetting, the training, the quality assurance. There's a very small hurdle for the city to overcome in order to implement a program that's, um, I think, tremendously beneficial on a number of levels. Um, so that's what I have. Thank you. <clears throat> I don't have much to add. He was very uh, thorough in what he said here. Um, I would just say, again, it's just giving visibility to the potential homeowner, the current homeowner, um, education and awareness in their footprint. Um, and as mentioned, some want to do good they, in giving visibility and what it's going to cost to heat your home, condition your home, you know, uh, have hot water. Those are all aspects that are very gray area right now. So from a homeowner's perspective, it's, um, it's a really good opportunity to just get a better lens. And then again, the data point, being able to understand where we could provide resources or funding down the road for potential um, equipment upgrades and other grant opportunities for specific homes and areas of the community that we see kind of hot spots for improvement. There's just a lot of opportunity down the road for that as well. Thank you. So, so what we're just looking for from you today is, like I said, just feedback questions. Like, are you generally comfortable with what we presented today? Are there big changes you'd like us to consider before ultimately bringing it back in the fall? And any other thoughts? Questions about what it actually details or how the program itself works? Or Let's give Councillor Segal a sec if he has anything. He's still there. Yeah. <laughs> I actually do have to leave. I didn't make sure to let, I didn't let everyone know here, but I do have another meeting. So I thank you for the time, Councillor Broadman, but I do not have any questions at this time. Great. I will make sure to reach out if I do, but I appreciate the opportunity before I had to leave. Thanks, Councillor. I appreciate that, that you're doing an open house. I think that will really help. Um, I feel like we've gotten a decent amount of emails about it. And I feel like this presentation really talked about everything that was in these emails. Um, you know, we hear a lot about like, just why can't we just give our utility bills, you know, and it's different, right? I mean, use is, use is a lot different than, than what we're talking about here. So I really appreciate that. And um, having, having that assistance program is really important, um, I think, to our city, just to make sure that that if it's something that um, a, a person selling their home cannot afford that, that the city would help out with that. So um, I think it's, I think it's great. I love the way you laid it out. Anything else? So what, I guess, why can't we, why couldn't you, if the house is occupied, why couldn't you have a, a wrap in your purchase and sale agreement that says, here's what my bills were for the last 12 months. Yeah. So the difference, did you want to answer that? at least take a shot at it. Yeah. It's a, it's a good question that comes up a lot. Um, the challenge with that is it's more like how many gallons did your car use last year? That's not how many gallons of gas did your car use? So how you used it, was it used all year, right. part of the year? Was there multiple drivers going constantly? Logistically, it's extremely challenging for people to get that information from their natural gas provider or their electric provider. When and if and when you can get it, what it's telling you is not super useful. It's how that particular previous owner used it, whether two kids, no kids, was it a rental, whatever the situation was, as opposed to a metric like a miles per gallon that says, this is how this car or this house is designed to perform. Um, by making this program required, the buyer will have that information they can compare immediately across the board instead of trying to research that information on, if you look at typical person looks at five to 15 houses, trying to dig that up on each house and then not knowing if it's an accurate representation of how they're gonna use that home and if that number is actually valid or not. So how the mechanisms the house has in it and how it's designed to perform is more important than like, how did it do last year if you can get that info? 
-hmm. Yeah. Somebody might want to have their thermostat set at 80 all winter <laughs> and 60 in the summer versus, you know, you just, it's, it's too big of information to determine. Um, did, has, has the committee looked at exemptions for any category of price of home? Like particular home, if it's listed at a certain, you know, 90% of the median home price? We have not looked at that metric. I would say the numbers you hear batted around about how much home energy score costs, like most things in the world, is based on the size of the house. Yeah. So if a house is smaller in size, it takes the... And it's logical. It takes a certifier less time. It costs less. If it's a great big house, it costs more. Um, there also, I think we, there's a provision in there that if a seller qualifies for any other city of Bend um, uh, income assistance, that they get compensated for it, recompensated. Uh, so they don't have to cover the cost. And typically right now we're seeing a $150 to $250 cost for a normal size house. Um, but Specifically, as far as a size of house, we have not looked at any kind of an exemption per se. There's other types of exemption, but not on size of the house. Okay. Um, so, in general, and I this probably goes beyond stewardship, but I'll ask it. <laughs> so, um, what is what do you expect the impact of this program to be on home affordability? So, because positive or negative. Yeah, the, because what I have heard, so the cost of the score is the one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And the kind of thinking out there is like $150 to $300, right. all not completely negligible on the cost of a home is a pretty small percentage. Mm -hmm. So as far as like the actual cost of the assessment, we don't, we don't really consider that to be a huge impact. Mm -hmm. The other concern that I've heard is um, people being worried that if a score if a score comes in really low, that it might make the house less, you know, like yeah. it might they might not be able to sell for as much. Or the flip side, if a score if it scores really high, it's going to add a ton of cost to it. And the thinking I've heard about that is that generally energy efficiency isn't usually seen like realistically. Other factors play into someone's decision larger than the energy efficiency does. So, and especially from like a negative impact, what I've read in some of the reports is that energy efficiency, there was like a term for it, but where it's like, it, it doesn't really ever have a negative impact, but it can have a positive impact if that makes sense. So it's unlikely to sway someone's decision where they're like, I'm going to spend, I'm not going to spend, you know, I'm going to like, right. I, if, that's if, not super articulate, yeah. but um, I would, anyway, you know, so other cities have not seen a big impact from that. And that's, we're thinking it would be similar here. And I would add, if your concern is equity or, you know, um, it's just home affordability. That's my only concern. Yeah. So a uh, score just, so for the general, not uh, background information score, um, as they look at scores across housing, it's not necessarily a small house that will have a, quite the contrary, a bad score or an expensive house that has a good score. Um, scores can vary all over the place. And the what I look at is kind of, we wanna enhance, let the market do its thing. I'm a proponent of market solutions to social, environmental, climate problems. So the market functions best when there's the most information possible. So we're adding one more data point to a home sales process. A lot of us have been through that. So you're looking at location, size, um, school districts, whatever it is. So one more piece of data here to allow people to make an informed decision that will be part of the negotiation one way or the other. The seller has the option to say, hey, I'm going to try to boost my price of my house. We know people fix up their landscaping and paint, or maybe they're going to add some insulation to their attic, which is super cheap and boost their score. Um, so I don't have any concern about a home energy score standing alone, uh, creating a greater affordability problem than we have in Bend right now. That's a you know supply and demand issues. It's certainly not one more data point in the transaction. It's one more potential point of negotiation if the parties care. So I mean, in general, the committee ECC thinks it's an insignificant impact one way or the other on affordability. Is it less than insignificant? Yes. Negligible. Negligible. 
Um, and then, so besides the FTE, the portion of the FTE, how much is this gonna cost the city to run, if anything? It should really just be that FTE and then um, the low income assistance program, which okay. wouldn't be. Because it all, you know, occurs through the private market. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess you could argue that maybe if we don't have enough people up and running, you delay listing. That's a potential issue. Um, but I, I'm assuming that would work itself out. Yeah, in terms of like if there wasn't a there was a lag. Level. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, other cities have have not seen that. Like people are able to get the assessments within a few days, and so that's where by monitoring the number of assessors, we could keep tabs on that. Like if it was causing a whole month delay in listing a home, mm. I think that would be grounds to like reevaluate if we want to put a pause and make sure we have more. Um, we're definitely, uh, the goal is to, is to make sure to monitor it so that it does not create those mm -hmm. types of potential issues. But the, but the experience has shown that it hasn't been issues in other communities. So we're not really anticipating it to be here either. And the timing of the program rollouts, like you have a runway to get the yeah. program going. And that's while there are ample folks in the town who are um, already interested in, in the home inspection field or in the home energy field. That's a good, nice add-on service for all of them. Mm -hmm. So I think the critical piece is just uh, coordinating the runway with the training and certification program. And as I said, there's already people today, if you want to call and get your Councilor Perkins, get your house checked. There's people doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so the timing's a bigger deal. Like if we, we want to start next Monday, then we're, right. we wouldn't yeah. be ready to go, but the rollout will be, make it pretty seamless. So say you list, say this program's in place, you list, you say, I'm not doing this. We call, they give, give them 15 days to get right. They don't do it. At that point they get one $750 fine. So it goes through this the standard code enforcement process, but I might ask, is Mary still on? Or yeah, I can just talk high level and Mary, you can fill in any gaps, but, you know, we always look to get folks in compliance. We don't just start with right. a fine. So, you know, my, my assumption would be the first attempt would be, we'll set a timeline. Hey, we'll give you more time. Here's what that would be. We would try a few, uh, we would try first before we would just issue a, a penalty. So they actually Sorry. end up having considerably more than 15 days before they're paying a penalty because it's 15 days, it doesn't even go to code, code enforcement. Then it goes to code enforcement. And if they typically give 30 days or something like that, they would get that additional right. before they're I'm just a penalty. I'm thinking of a somebody who's, we, some of us, a lot of us went through the last recession. You're close to underwater. You don't qualify to for assistance because you were doing fine at some point. You've got to get out of a house. In theory, you could list it be liable for the penalty and still be within, you know, a workout period to actually pay it until you sold the house. Right. Like you could keep, you could, you, you only, you're only going to get, have to pay your $750 fine once you've been contacted, you know, in that first 15 day period. Yeah. Well, and you don't have to pay it until after. So you get contact in the 15 days and that's when it's just someone saying, Hey, just so you know, you need a score. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I'm not going to get the score. Um, then you'd wait the 15 days. It goes to code enforcement. They give you an additional 30 days or, or whatever it is. And then, and if your house is sold before then, like we don't actually have a mechanism to even follow up on that. And if it's, if it's not, you would eventually get issued the penalty, but it would be, it could be as late as like 45 days later before you get the first penalty. Okay. Mary, any detail you wanted to provide beyond that? Yeah, I mean, we do voluntary compliance, as Kathy just explained, and this is kind of an unusual program. So I think um, code enforcement is going to have to work through how it works after the grace period and then how, how voluntary compliance works and whether it's worth it to go to court with a fine. I mean, they're, they're gonna have to sort through all that, but Cassie's right. There's quite a bit of time built into the process and then some discretionary decisions. I mean, it, it's always discretionary whether to actually prosecute towards fines. Um, I think it probably will depend on what code enforcement sees and why the person didn't go ahead and try to do the assessment of the home energy score. Okay. I mean, the, the intent of this is to get people 
as many as possible in Bend to do home energy scores. It's not to get people fined in a municipal court. That isn't a good use of everybody's time and energy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in the same place I was last time we talked. I mean, I, I feel like this isn't nearly enough. Um, I'm anxious to start having a conversation about eliminating natural gas from new construction. I feel like some of this activity is sort of, it, I, I think it's been executed perfectly. I'm not suggesting that the committee and staff haven't done an amazing job, but um, I, I'm anxious and feel like we're not moving quickly enough. Um, and also some of the other actions that we're taking on council are inconsistent with our larger climate goals. And so, um, I don't, I don't know how I, I, I'm not, I haven't decided one way or the other how I feel about this in terms of stewardship. I think it's a responsible use of our resources. Cassie, do you wanna just um, go back to the climate, the community climate action plan and what the, this program kind of how, what we attributed uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction to the home energy score program and kind of where it fits within the context of the broader plan? Yeah, so in our community climate action plan, we have kind of like the big buckets of greenhouse gas emissions were um, buildings, and we have that kind of broken up, kind of equally split between residential and commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. That's like the majority, I think 57% of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from our energy use in buildings. Transportation is the next biggest chunk. That's like a third of our emissions. Um, and then a, a smaller amount is waste and materials and then industrial process emissions. And so I think Peter um, explained it really well earlier is that among building emissions, like there's no one solution that can get at everything. So we have kind of all these little, you know, different programs have to target these different sectors. And so where the home energy score really is focused on um, existing residential construction. So that's kind of the piece of the pie that, that this targets. Some of the other things like um, looking at new construction, you know, just is a different area. And in reality, we need all the pieces of the puzzle, you know, in order to, to make the reductions. Um, so that's kind of where it fits. I think this, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I am in favor of this because I love the idea of you know, sort of empowering you know, homeowners to be able to, you know, these are the changes that I can make as a homeowner to, to my home. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and I also think that, that what you were saying about, um, you know, this is going to provide us with some data points of things that, you know, trends that we're seeing, um, you know, from all these home energy scores that are that things, future things that we can do as a city to make a difference too. So. Um, there's a lot of data around the fact that when people make changes to home, whether they be remodels. Um, it's typically at the time of transaction. Um, so I think that that uh, yeah. inserting this uh, score at the time of listing the house is one of the most effective ways to kind of start building that data set and also a very convenient and the most uh, cost effective time to try to make these uh, any energy changes voluntary that you choose to make if you are someone who wants to take advantage of the information provided. So if you're gonna be doing cosmetic, a lot of people renovate, remodel, even freshen up a house um, before they've moved in and their personal effects are in, this is an ideal practical time to do that. And also one thing I'll add to you, um, Councilor Broadman, to your point about kind of like this, as opposed to more kind of sweeping changes is that, um, you know, the Community Climate Action Plan was developed over a period of time and adopted in 2019. And so the committee has been working really within that plan. Right. And some of the things that you mentioned were not included in the plan. And I, um, I think at, they were discussed a little bit at the time, but at the, you know, some of those were intentionally not included back then. So that's not, you know, so that's sure. kind of what, where we're at, I think. And the committee's been focused really on, we have the adopted plan, carrying that forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll, we um, wanted to update the plan every three to five years. So I can't believe it, but that's coming up very soon. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there will be more opportunities when we kind of look at, you know, our climate action in general and, and what direction does the council want to go? We'll have opportunities in the coming years. Right. I mean, the issue is when it comes to climate, we're way too late. So um, I appreciate that we're operating within the confines of this plan. I just, I think it's inadequate. Um, I know a lot of people feel the same way, but just being bound to, you know, what's what a past council wrote three years ago, I, I don't think it's going to make a meaningful 
um, impact when it comes to the bend action that we can take on, on climate. Yeah, I appreciate your concerns. Um, mm -hmm. uh, before we break up, I was just gonna say if the counselors are interested in drilling down on more of the specifics or any of the kind of ins and outs and working of these things, I'm happy to avail myself of a little bit of time. I'm, Cassie can tell you how to connect. Um, but I've really done quite a bit of deep digging on the program. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we have what we need. And yeah, so next step is we'll come back to you all in the fall once the committee is ready to formally propose the program. Thank you. Thank the, out, you. the outreach program is going to be critical for all of us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, an update from Envision Bend, as well as a request for continued sponsorship. I'm going to have uh, Laura Fritz uh, come up, and then inter there's some, I think, some additional folks too that are part of the process. Um, I did want to hand out a few things. Um, I know that Mickey gave these things to folks in advance, but I wanted you to see them printed. Um, should I give yeah, them to sure. somebody? Yes, yeah. we'll, we'll just pass them around. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You received most of these pieces, and I'll call out the ones that you didn't. And if I need to give some to you, as well. oh, yeah. I have it online. Perfect. Thank you. Oops. Wrong place. Um, thank you, and good afternoon. Um, I'm Laura Fritz. I am the executive director of Envision Bend, and we have our chair of the board, James Derofi, here with me today, and also our vice chair, Ted Schoenborn. So wanted to call them out and thank them for their volunteer work with the organization. So um, I thought we would have a new um, member on the, on the committee who's not as familiar. So I did build in some background about the project to bring um, him up to date. And so I'll skip, run through that, just get everybody on the same page and then get on to what we're doing now and where we're going. So I'll, um, just a reminder, Envision Bend is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit organization. And our mission is to bring um, diverse stakeholders together to educate, engage, and empower all members of the Bend community to have a voice in our city's future. Um, we have 12 members on our board. They are from all over the city, and we have one half-time staff person, and that is me. <laughs> um, so Envision Bend is indeed managing the Bend Vision Project, and the purpose of that project is to create a long-range vision for our community that describes our desired destiny in 10, 20 years down the road. And then that vision serves as kind of the North Star of where we want to be, guiding private activities, public activities, so and so on. You guys, I know, are familiar, familiar with this. And the last time this was done was more than 16 years ago. So ben, the Ben Vision Project is going to take about 18 months. We're about seven months into it at this point. So we do anticipate completing the project in the first half of 2023. And at the end of the day, those the deliverables, I mean, there are a lot of intangibles that come along with the work that we're doing, but the deliverables will be a statement of core community values. It will be that community long-range vision statement and a five-year action plan that's organized into priority areas that have arisen from the public engagement um, that then has strategies and programs that we can do to tackle the issues in, in those um, priority areas or focus areas. Um, when that first five-year action plan is completed, we then go back and do another five-year plan so that we're continually marching towards that vision that the community has created. Um, back in October 2021, you may recall that um, we came before you and asked for a $50,000 sponsorship for this project to cover part of the cost of the project. Um, I'll remind you that at that time, we said that we hoped that the city would cover half the cost of the project and that Envision Bend would then do the uh, fundraising to cover the other half of the project. And so $50,000 was not half, uh, you know, 
half of that half at the time. But we really wanted to show to you that our organization, this nonprofit, could lead a really robust public participation process that was equitable and inclusive. And we got plenty of feedback from the city council that that was a goal as well. So um, now at this point, we're almost finished with the scope of services from that from that sponsorship. And so we're back here to talk to you about what we've done and where we're headed and ask for continued support. Um, I will say that the project scope has changed a little bit since when we first came to you um, back in October. Um, you'll recall, recall that when we got this sponsorship, we had provided the city council um, a, a an equitable engagement framework document that we were uh, we plan to use throughout the process of this project, and that that called for transparent, inclusive, and collaborative engagement, as well as continual efforts to learn and adapt along the way with the project. And so we have indeed used that. We have um, rejiggered things that we were doing because we realized we needed to do more engagement in certain areas, and I'll share with you how that has manifested itself as I go through my presentation. Um, so now I'd like to move a little bit to um, a few other topics. I'd like to talk about our accomplishments so far, um, where, where we are right now. Um, I want to address some particulars about our efforts to have broad-based in, and inclusive process, what's coming next, and of course, our financial request um, from the city. So we began the project in earnest in January of this year, and much of that work really, um, although it wasn't super visible to the community, it was indeed very important for laying the foundation for the project. So we um, conducted 50 out of 60 individual interviews. So far, we're still, we still have a few more to go. And these interviews um, have been with a very diverse audience of community leaders and connectors. So at this time, 35% of those who have been interviewed are um, uh, people in our community who are part of the BIPOC, BIPOC community. We also have made very concerted efforts to include other people from underrepresented communities and um, historically marginalized, such as the LGBTQ plus uh, community, as well as disabled community. Um, we had originally planned 32 interviews. That was part of the scope of services. And we just did not feel that that was broad enough. We, we realized we have to expand this um, to, to really get deeply into our community. Um, in addition to those interviews, we also interviewed and enlisted the support of 17 organizations um, that have broad reach into our community. And within that packet that I provided to you, there is a document, it's just a list of the key partners um, for this project. It is um, very, you know, it's from every corner of the community, frankly. And we've, we felt it was super important for us to have partners helping us get into the community to encourage participation. So we have every, everyone from the Chamber of Commerce um, to Neighbor Impact who has signed up, one, to endorse the project itself, to encourage their um, employees and their constituents to participate, engage in the project, and then also provide in-kind support in certain ways when it's appropriate, like space for a focus group or helping, helping work with us to um, bring communities of interest together for some of the meetings that we're having um, coming up. And I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. Um, we, also, um, we also have completed the environmental scan. That was something that was sent out to you by um, Ms. Sturting, and I didn't bring a copy of it because it is 30 pages, but you do have that online. And that is a deep dive into uh, major themes and corresponding um, trends that are likely to impact our community in the future. As this study really dives into these issues, both at the national, regional, and local level, and we'll continue to update it along the way so that when we're finished with this project, that is very um, up-to-date and, and relevant. And uh, we also have uh, completed this snapshot report that's in your packet. I did want you to see it in Israel format because 
online, you know, it looks like just separate pages, but this is a summary overview of the things that we've learned so far in the project. And I, I want to emphasize so far because, of course, we haven't um, real, we have not by any means completed the broad public participation. And so those things could change, but there are some patterns that already are developing and you can see that in, in that report. Um, I think you may be aware that we also um, were the featured program, the Ben Vision Project was the featured program at um, City Club in June. It was great attendance. There are about 125 people in the room, which was super exciting given our times. And um, it, pr prior to that City Club event, we reached out to many individuals who we had interviewed as part of this process and our partner organizations and invited um, people to attend the event on our dime so that they would be included, that they could continue to participate in that project. So that was really, really fun. Um, I already mentioned the snapshot report, losing my place here. So uh, one of the key um, in strategies that we have for meet, um, for this project is to meet people where they're already gathering. And so um, another thing that we have done so far in the summer and will continue is we are showing up at events where um, our community is gathering. We um, have had a booth at Juneteenth, the Juneteenth celebration at Pride Fest, at Summerfest and the opening of Alpen Gold Park. Um, we're scheduled to be at Munch and Music and the Rotary Duck Race in September. And we're looking for more opportunities where the community is gathering. It's really been exciting to do that, um, to engage in that way and just talk to people and then also encourage them to attend some of our other activities and take the survey. Just about two weeks ago, we had launch week and launch week was really our official public um, you know, our public facing uh, launch of the project. And we held a press conference that generated a lot of coverage, which hopefully you saw, but the um, press conference was great because we had three partners come and attend with us. We had the executive director of Bethlehem in with us. We had the executive director of EDCO uh, as a panelist, as well as this uh, deputy superintendent of the High Desert Education Service District. And they all came and talked about the challenges that they expect or they see our community facing in the future and why they support the Ben Vision Project. So that was a great way to start off um, launch week. And um, we, we were really delighted with the coverage and, um, and so on. Now, of course, we're continuing to promote the project through our communications plan, through our social media strategy, um, go, having more booths, um, the columns in the newspaper. And then um, we also have the um, bulletin as a key partner for this project. And you may have seen that they've had a few editorials about the project and they've Every time they've mentioned we are actually supporting this because they have to um, declare that for sure. So that's a, a quick summary of what where what we've done so far, and I want to tell you about where we are now. So as I mentioned, we're really in the public engagement, the the public facing um, robust engagement part of the process. And so the focus of the rest of the summer and into the early fall is really about getting out into the community, encouraging people to participate in our listen and envision workshops. Um, they're very intentionally called listen and envision workshops. Um, and also to take the survey, the survey, which of course we have in both English and Spanish. Um, we have launched the survey um, at, that, at that time, I think it was July 13th. Um, and we are have well over 700 respondents so far, so we're just delighted about that. That's a tremendous start. Um, we're, the survey will remain open probably until mid-September um, because, you know, summertime, people come and go, come and go. There are lots of different ways that we can um, activate people to take the survey um, over that time. So we will be paying attention to the demographics that come in with the survey. So if we're finding that we're not reaching certain, certain audiences, we can then organize and really try to get out to those communities. I think that's super important. Um, we're holding a bunch of uh, uh, listen and envision workshops. Uh, five of them are virtual and they're open to the public. 
Um, we will add more if we need to. We may also add one in person. We're kind of holding off to see whether or not we should do that. Of course, we don't want to be a super spreader event. So we're kind of taking a sense of the community about whether or not they do want to gather in person that way. So we will probably add some sessions. But in addition to those sessions, we're going to have about 20 or 25 um, other sessions that are targeted at communities of interest. Um, we're working with our, our key partners on those sessions. So um, for example, uh, reaching out to the Latino community and making sure we have a session working with the Latino Community Association, one in, one in English and one also in Spanish, and really using our partners to um, work with us so that those, those communities can be engaging in a way that feels safe, that with trusted folks, and um, and so that we can set it up in a way that meets the needs of the community. Do we need to pr provide childcare? Do we need to bring food? Do we need to um, you know have other activities around this so that it's something people want to go to? So we're working. Those key partners really are um, a tr tremendous asset to the project itself because they'll be helping us with that. Um, both our board and our consultants are very involved in a lot of outreach. Um, we're reaching out to in. From a grassroots standpoint, um, our board is reaching out to about 100 organizations and, and businesses this summer, trying to get them aware of the project and so on. Um, we have some, some nice materials that we're using to promote it. You'll see that we have these rack cards that are in English and in Spanish. Where we want to get them into grocery bags. I think that would be a really great way to reach a broad-based community. We also have these drink coasters that have the QR code um, of the, for, to do the survey on the back. And we're hoping we can get those in restaurants as well as breweries in town. Um, uh, and so that's generally what's going to happen over the, the summer. So um, from my comments, I hope you can see that we really have been focused on trying to reach the entire community. Um, it really truly has been a goal of ours right from the get-go. And we're continually listening to the feedback, adapting and um, addressing those issues. And um, I'll remind you also that we, in addition to working with um, you know, local partners who know our community, we also have been working with Oregon's Kitchen Table, which is that or organization um, out of Portland State University that has statewide reach in um, trying to get um, traditionally um, voices that traditionally have not been at the table involved in projects. So they have been involved in looking at our process design from the start, and they will continue to be. In addition to that, we have been working really closely with um, Zavi Borja. And, and I will say, I got to do a shout out because he's been tremendously helpful and is really enthusiastic. Um, knows, uh, you know, almost, I swear, I think he knows everybody in town almost at this point. So you guys have done a great job in, in that selection. Um, he has been super, super helpful. And we um, probably meet with him monthly, but then anywhere we go in town, we run into him too. So that's uh, pretty fun. Um, so let's see, where are we, where are we headed? That's, that's what you need to know as well. That's the next things that are coming up. So we have three remaining phases. Um, I've talked about phase three. That's really about the listen and envision sessions, survey implementation, and just intense public outreach through communication strategies and just grassroots pound in the pavement. Phase four is all about finalizing um, a number of things, the shared values from uh, public input, um, finalizing focus areas for the vision plan, um, drafting the community vision statement, and then just defining the strategic issues and, and draft strategies um, that address the things that the community is really interested in seeing our, our community move towards. Um, at that time, during phase four, we will also form um, and activate vision action teams that are comprised of community members um, who specialize in some of the areas, but also are just community members who are engaged and want to participate in this type of process. And those vision action teams um, will be experts, but also will be um, a diverse representation to help actually create the five-year action plan. 
Phase five then is about finalizing the plan um, and launching the vision and action plan in our community. Um, it's about identifying those game changer projects that partners in our community are willing to step up and participate in and try to really make happen. We're not gonna identify these activities where nobody is raising their hand and saying, yeah, I can come to the table and be part of that. Um, that, that would mean we'd end up with a plan that just sits on a shelf. Um, and then really celebrating it, bringing it out to the community and celebrating it, and then beginning implementation, including identifying the um, metrics that we're going to use to measure whether we're marching in the right direction and achieving our goals. So that's where we're headed. Um, so our, our, I want to talk to you about, you know, really why I'm here today, or ask. Um, our, project, our project will cost $265,000. This does not include any costs associated with um, staff time at Envision Bend or our operational costs as an organization. We, as a, as a nonprofit, have raised $135,000 to date. Um, you have a list of project investors on um, in that packet that I provided to you, and um, that does not include the $50,000 that the City of Bend has sponsored us for. Um, but I will say, and I'm very happy to say, that we did secure a $25,000 sponsorship from Deschutes County recently. Um, so really, really happy about that. We know that a lot of the issues that we're addressing are not confined to municipal board borders. And so um, that was a really, really big win and, and hard fought. <laughs> we're responsible for land within the municipal borders also. Oh, of course, of course. Good point. You, you know what I'm talking about. I just, um, you know, they were very interested in the project all along. It just was a question of whether or not they really were going to put the funding in. And they have been very willing to partner with us in terms of sharing information and that sort of thing. So I don't mean to imply um, anything uh, at first about that. Uh, so we're really happy about that. I, we felt that it was really important to have their logo on, on this project as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the methodology that we had planned to use for this project always was listen, learn, and adapt. We've employed, employed that methodology. Um, we've done a number of things. We've increased the number of interviews that we are um, conducting. We've um, We've changed some of the questions we're asking um, about individual experiences on how and why individuals do or do not feel welcome in our community. So we adjusted the um, interview um, um, uh, tool, I should say. Um, we've expanded the number of listen and vision sessions as well. I'm gonna have a lot more um, for communities of interest. Um, and we also have learned from um, our key partners on different ways to approach things and meeting people where they're already gathering and so on. So we've made a number of adjustments um, along the way to try to remove barriers for participation. Right now, we have just started into phase three and per the sponsorship that the city um, uh, and we had to get had together with Envision Bend. We're almost completed with what was in, um, entailed in that scope of services. So we're back here asking for additional support. And our request today is for eighty thousand um, dollars. Again, this does not include any of our operational costs or my staff time, which is put into this project. Um, but it does indeed represent half the cost of the project with our organization. Um, uh, raising the rest of it. I will remind you, uh, actually, Eric can probably talk about this, but the last time this was done, the city did the project in and of itself. And so I do think that um, this is super valuable to the future of our community and it's a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll stop right now. I've been, my mouth is dry. So I know I've been talking an awful lot, um, but I, if you have questions, um, feedback, whatever, I'm available and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Um, well, I think, you know, I was, I was, I was pretty skeptical the first time you came <laughs> um, to stewardship and I, I attended the city club event. I've been following the project and, um, and hearing sort of what you said today about the outreach that you're doing. And it was really thoughtful outreach, um, which I really appreciate. I also appreciate that as a group, you're not shying away from the hard challenges and the struggles that we have as a community, you know, while also doing sort of the aspirational part, which I think is really important. Um, I just have a small suggestion. I hope that, I know that you have that 
partnership with Neighbor Impact. I hope that you're getting some people with lived experience with houselessness, or maybe that might be sort of in uh, unstable housing situations, because I think that's also a right. Really- and I I haven't asked this yet, um, but it is on actually my my plan of action. Um, I've been thinking about this. Um, I'm trying to remember who I was speaking to that sparked the idea, but um, I want to contact Scott Cooper and see if we can get these um, rat cards into um, the food bank and the uh, deliveries. Um, that might be one good way to reach that community. Is, uh, and, you know, we're still brainstorming and we're open to ideas. Absolutely. Um, I've also we have other partners that we might be able to reach out to as well. Mosaic Medical is indeed a partner as well, and they have. Um, actually taken a bunch of our rack cards and are distribute, distributing them as well. And I think that that's, they're a key partner in reaching, um, you know, low, low income hardship house, you know, uh, individuals and families. Um, will this, I mean, it, that's a lot of money. So I'm wondering if, is this going to alleviate some of the, I mean, we have various sort of visioning projects, I think, that are sort of underway with council right now. Is there anything that this would alleviate that would save us in the long run? I'm concerned about. I mean, there's some, there is some work um, with, and I know you've talked with Brian Rankin in our growth management department. And so I think there's some that could, could be, I don't have details on where there might be some ways that we could take this this sort of foundational work and apply it to things like the economic opportunity analysis or the housing production. It's, those are pretty technical, but there's some pieces. Yeah. Well, and because we are asking those demographic questions at the end of the survey, we do, we will have data that's available and that we're, we'll be sharing with the city and with the County, whoever, you know, is interested in it. Um, We wanted to be able to, um, to look at the data that way. And I would just ask the city. So the 80,000, where are we? thinking of taking it. That would be through the American Rescue Plan Act, the mon- the funds that we have left in reserves. Okay. Which is about 1.2 to 1.3 million. Okay. Yeah, I mean, on one hand, we're looking at this and then we're looking at having to implement CFEC and all of the other initiatives that we have in front of us. So I, I just, I think, you know, obviously there's a finite amount out there of what we can do. Um, so I'm looking for ways that, this, we can be efficient with this and it'll help us in our other initiatives. I'm very focused on the home affordability and transportation components of this. So if it could help us meet our goals in that regard, I would feel better about it. I know it will, but without the work product in front of us, it's difficult. Yeah. And maybe I, we could request, I mean, on that note, so it looks like on your, you know, kind of the identified focus areas, you have affordability, um, livability inclusion, if there's some more specific tie-ins to city council goals for us to be able to leverage the work, um, I think that is what I'm hearing from Councilor Broadman of being able to apply some of the outreach and ideas, and maybe goes into innovation as well. You know, we are constantly looking for strategies to address our housing crisis. And so if there's something that comes from there, I, I might, maybe I'm. I, that's great. I mean, that's a great idea. I don't, I, I don't, I'm sort of at a loss of how to, um, how to get comfortable with it. Um, but I do think it's, it's great work. Um, I would love it if um, this group could talk to the Human Rights and Equity Commission and do some form of public engagement that way. Um, I think that would be really helpful in, you, in sort of a, a good visioning session as well. Great. Yeah. And I think I just met the new, um, Manager, I think, is it Ann? Anna? Anna. Anna. Al- Alan, am I mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, I did have a um, conversation with her the other day. It was happenstance. She got invited by another person who um, I wanted to talk to because um, they weren't super supportive. So yeah. wanted to have that conversation, and so Anna was called into it and just um, probe. Okay, what what is it that we should I should know? Mm-hmm. So, but um, yeah, I'll write that down. Absolutely, we'd love that that opportunity for sure. If we get on agenda, sure. So I guess I need some direction from from the two of you on proceeding with the request or a modified version of that request. I'm in support. So so Stephen's not here, so I either agree or we're (laughs) at a stalemate. 
I don't know if there's some compromise. Um, I guess with the understanding that we're going to work together to make sure that this dovetails with our goals. I'm not sure we can operate outside of our goals. Just as a, it's not good. Policy. Well, in general, our yeah, our sponsorship really puts everything back towards council goals. So there are our policies really, I think, focus us there, which is what the type of an arrangement we have with Envision Bend is through a sponsorship. It's not through a procurement process. Right. So I, I'm okay. I'll, I'll concur with Councilor Perkins with the, you know, caveat that I, I would like you to continue to work with staff to make sure that the work product here, dovetail, since we are sponsoring to the tune of double what Deschutes County is already and much more if we make this contribution, I would like this to be a tool that we can use to accomplish our goals. Yep. And in a way, council is the product of the vision of Bend. Every two years, Ben gets to have right. its vision. And Absolutely. so I, I, mean, I, I know we're already working together closely, um, but if the product could dovetail and be a more useful tool to help us execute our goals, um, you know, that puts some limitations on your, you know, your, your sort of discretion and freedom about what you're looking at. But I think it's important for our sponsorship. So we can't um, decide what the vision says. Right. Obviously, that's the community speaks and guides that work. The final um, vision is not intended to duplicate what is already happening in the community. It's intended to complement or, um, you know, uh, be something separate that is not happening. Um, it's to build on and not reinvent the wheel. And so, um, you know, I provide a every two or three months um, report to Eric about what we're doing and what we're finding. And I, I, I welcome any opportunity to present to the council yeah. about what we're finding, go to the um, human um, equity commission. Uh, that, that kind of thing is just terrific for the project itself. And, you know, we're all about listening and getting feedback so that we're doing the best project possible. Um, I do see already, you know, the focus areas that are defined in the, in the snapshot report, um, the community has not spoken, so they could change. It's very unlikely that a lot of them will change yeah. because we all know what's at top of mind in in the community. Affordability is um, is right is the top of the heap, right? So so I want to just be careful about what I'm promising since it does need to be the community's vision and not. Um, the council's vision, but I do think that it dovetails very nicely with the work you do, and it complements the work you do. And by having a closer kind of reporting uh, arrangement and presentation, I think we can accomplish the goals that you need. Great. Okay, so I'm going to proceed with the request as is, but what we'll do is we'll put some conditions around um, uh, further discussions with the Human Rights and Equity Commission, as well as um, kind of updates. Maybe I think what what I would like to hear is maybe an update in December, kind of as we lead into council goal setting, so that we can use whatever information that you have and honoring the process and community input. But that way, it can be um, really seen as a. I mean, we already have a listening session as part of council goal setting, but I think something almost as a standalone and using the stewardship subcommittee would be helpful That's because terrific. you're taking that deeper dive. Welcome, that. That's terrific. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take the survey, please. <laughs> I've already sent it out. Excellent. Excellent. Tell everybody. Now. Thanks for your time. Okay, and then just we had a few really. Uh, well, one item that was just uh, is on the listed on the agenda, but uh, Kevin was not able to attend, so we'll defer that to the, our next meeting. And then just kind of a last uh, or just an update on the American Rescue Plan Act and um, other information. I think one of the big things that I wanted to share with this group and the public is uh, we are moving forward with our collaborative um, office. So we have executive director interviews, uh, first round of interviews this Friday, and then panel interviews are taking place on August 11th. And I know, I think Councillor Perkins and Broadman will be involved in that process. Um, so we'll have hopefully about three or so candidates for you to review. So just wanted to update you there because that, that, that's been a topic of the stewardship subcommittee. And then we just provided this report. It was in the council memo as well, just a, an update on where the, the funding from the American Rescue Plan Act is, is, is going. So this is the 330000 that was distributed 
and it gives you a real sense of on the ground of how it's impacting um, individuals and families. Yeah, so you um, you uh, recommended allocation of funding, $330,000 to community members who are negatively impacted by COVID, especially the houseness community members. And we awarded seven organizations, and this is the impact of the investment. We have, um, we, we received reporting and we pulled some highlights from that report, um, just amazing. Um, impact 23,000 meals served in just the second quarter of this year. From, and that was missing one month because we didn't provide the funding until May. Um, you know, 108 new clients served at Kids Center. And just, you know, when you get a chance, take a look at this one pager. And then um, Dawn's house purchased four cabins and is on track to move in women and children by the beginning of this month. And I want to share with you some photos that Dawn shared. Um, ooh, I had it open. There we go. So there's the Don's house team. Let me use maximize this. Oh, there we go. And, oops. Here's a picture of the cabin. Cool. And there's four of them. Nice. Then. There it is. So they ended up actually having to raise another $15,000 to be up to code. And then they had to be creative with like finding who could paint it. They got volunteers. And so now fast forward to today, they're going to be able to move in folks beginning of August. So, and then that's it. Yeah. Great. Love that. And on that note. Yeah, exactly. That's a really nice note. Thank you to everybody for uh, getting, getting ready for this meeting. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.